Holbrook Travel is pleased to be bringing you this webinar today, Understanding eBird and Merlin Bird ID. Uh, we're excited to be joined by some special guests from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, Dr. Jenna Curtis, Sarah Toner, and Drew Weber. They'll be sharing with us some information about how to use eBird and Merlin Bird IT, ID and how these two different tools work together and, and overlap. Um, so some of the things they'll be sharing with us today include how to use eBird Explore and targets to find new places to bird and new species that you want to see, using eBird Mobile to submit checklists and upload photos and recordings to keep a scrapbook of your world birding adventures, using Merlin Bird ID to identify new birds, especially when you're on the go in new parts of the world. And they'll also be talking about why this data matters for science and conservation. And like I said, at the end, we'll be having time for Q&A. So just to quickly uh, tell you about each of our panelists, uh, Dr. Jenna Curtis is uh, eBird project co-leader for uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Her work focuses on enhancing engagement and communication among eBird contributors, regional data editors, and their scientific partners. She works to develop resources to support and instruct eBirders and eBird reviewers alike because an active, knowledgeable eBird community means more high quality data for bird conservation. Her career interests lie at the intersection of science, conservation, and public engagement. We're also joined today by Sarah Toner, who is curatorial assistant for Merlin Bird ID. Sarah helps develop new content, curates photos and text to improve existing bird packs and develop new ones, and she designs new tools for the app. She attended Cornell and became involved in a lot of different projects with the lab, including both outreach and research. And we're joined by Drew Weber, project coordinator for Merlin Bird ID. Drew focuses on providing people with tools to identify birds regardless of their background and expertise. He also leads, sorry, he also leads the development team in dreaming up and implementing new features for Merlin to help users identify birds. And additionally, he manages web development projects that span across eBird and Macaulay Library, making this fast data resources easy to access and interpret and to improve the quality and quantity of data being submitted each year. Uh, lastly, our discussion will be moderated by Holbrook Travel Specialty Consultant, Jen Hodge. Jen organizes travel programs for groups interested in birding, natural history, photography, and other educational topics. Her background includes event planning, environmental education, and zoo live animal programs. Jen is herself an avid birder, and some of you may recognize her uh, from her work coordinating the San Diego Bird Festival and with organizations like the Tracy Aviary and Hawk Watch International. So welcome to all of our uh, panelists today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jenna, who will tell you a little bit more about eBird. Welcome, Jenna. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to load my presentation. All right. So thanks for joining us, everyone. We're here to talk about eBird and Merlin ID and how they can help you and how your observations can help science. We all know that birds are beautiful. They are charismatic. They're fun to watch and observe. And they occur everywhere around the globe so that no matter where you are, birds are also there. What eBird does is it gives you and other bird enthusiasts a way to explore, track, and save bird observations in a way that supports science and conservation. You may think this is a map of cities or population centers around the world, but what this actually is is a map of eBird observations. So these are bird observations submitted by people like you. Uh, every pinpoint of light is an eBird checklist or bird observation. And as you can see from here, eBird covers the entire globe. All of those little dots in the ocean are people on cruises or uh, shipping lines that are observing birds in the middle of the ocean. Um, you can also see that there are some places where we could use more data, particularly in Central Africa and Russia, where there are birds and we would love to know more about the birds that people see there. Uh, but that overall, eBird is this global network of people sharing and uh, tracking their bird observations. eBird's typical growth is about 20% over the previous year, and this has continued since the project began. One interesting thing you can see in our growth charts is that there is an annual peak in observations around the breeding season in North America, so you can actually track when birders are observing birds based on their submissions to eBird. 
eBird currently has over uh, 50, over 500,000 data contributors covering 10,507 species. That is 98% of the world's birds are uh, in, eBird, in the eBird database as observations. We have over 60 million checklists and as of last month, over 800 million individual bird observations. And one thing that very recently has been um, exciting and interesting to us is that this uh, recent spring migration period, checklists and users are, are up over 40%, which is double our expected growth. Audio recordings are up nearly 100%, and photo uploads are up 53%. So these are all well above our typical growth that we would expect from eBird. 2020 is a very um, exciting year to be an eBird participant. This is record-setting growth for us. We are currently on track this May for 1 million bird observations per day. So every day, 1 million birds are observed and reported to eBird. And on May 9th, which is our global big day, we had a world record setting 114,000 checklists. Actually, as of a couple, <laughs> as of recently, it was over 115,000 checklists by over 50,000 participants all coming together on a single day to submit their bird observations. So eBird is a massive global network of bird enthusiasts sharing their information. eBird works through a combination of bird observations submitted through our mobile app and our eBird website. The mobile app is what you may be most interested in. It's a free application that allows you to track and submit your bird observations in the field. So while you're out birding, you can keep a list of the birds you see and then submit it to the eBird website. The easy thing about the app is that it automatically collects a lot of information, such as your location, date, time. It all collects it automatically for you. So all you have to do is focus on the birds. The phone then uses your GPS and previous eBird data to generate a list of expected species for your area. So while you're entering birds into the checklist, you're getting a list of birds that might be expected for where you are. There's different ways that you can sort your information on the app, such as by most likely species or by taxonomy. And then you can just keep a list of the individual birds you see as you go. Um, you can also look up individual birds that you might have seen. And when you're done, you have a chance to review, share, and then submit your list. Again, things like distance traveled and the time that you were birding is automatically calculated, so you don't have to worry about the effort information. The app keeps all of that logged for you. The eBird platform, especially the app, can be a little intimidating if you're a new beginner and you're like, wow, I don't even know that I need to keep a distance estimate or why do I need to track how long I've been birding? Basic questions like that, we have a free online course that helps you get started using eBird quickly and step-by-step. Step. It's called our eBird Essentials course. Again, it's completely free. It takes a few hours or you can break it up over the course of a couple days. And then this will give you the best foundation to get started using eBird. All of your beginner questions, how do I submit a checklist? What is a checklist? Those sorts of things are all answered on this course. And it also helps you to appreciate and understand how your data, the, the submissions that you submit are being used for science and conservation. We highly encourage you to take this course if you're interested in using eBird. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to be explaining some of the ways that everyone can use eBird, how scientists use eBird. And if you want to get involved, eBird Essentials is the best place to get started. So some of the features that eBird offers. So eBird's goal, fundamentally, is to create a database of reliable bird observations for science and conservation through citizen scientist contributions. And by citizen scientists, I mean people like you. We're all citizen scientists. However, there are some features beyond science and conservation that we offer that you may find interesting. We can walk some of those features here, particularly ways to find new birds, ways to find new places to bird, whether it's close to home or on the go, ways to track your personal observations and see when you've met new benchmarks or found new life birds, sharing your checklist with friends, and archiving your photos and audio recordings. Um, so I'm gonna go through a live walkthrough of eBird right now with all of you, just to kind of see how this program works and how you may be able to use it on your next trip or close to home. If you're gonna stay home for a little bit, you can still use these same tools to find the birds that are near you. So we're gonna start on the eBird homepage. This is where you'll go to submit your observations, if you don't have the mobile app or don't want to use it, if you have written out checklists, this is a great way to submit those onto the eBird website. You'll want to sign up for an account so you can do that. And it's also where you can explore existing data. So we're going to click on the Explore tab. 
And this is where you can go to, to look at existing eBird observations. One place that Holbrook Travel goes is Tanzania. That seems like a really exciting place to travel. I'd love to go there. So we're going to use eBird to explore the birds of Tanzania a little bit. Let's start with target species. Target species is a way to find the birds that you are most likely to see in an area. So if we click on target species and we enter Tanzania, and I wanna know all of the birds year round in this country that I need for my world life list. These are birds that I've never seen before. And if I click here, all of the data you're seeing on, these website, on this website is contributed by other public birders. This isn't a scientific um, study that went into Tanzania and looked for birds. These are other people who visited this country or live there who are submitting bird observations. So it's entirely powered by citizen science. And it looks like, based on this list, there are almost a thousand species that I could see in Tanzania throughout the year. The most likely one is the common bulbul. What does that look like? I can click on this species to go to another part of the site, the species pages, which are where you can see photos, uh, your observations and other observations for that country, sounds if you want to learn what the bird looks like or sounds like. These are all features and again these photos and sounds are recorded by people just like you and me as well. So it's a good way to see how other people are experiencing the common bulbul or any other bird. And then we can also look at the range map here. Click on large map and this will show me a live map of all of the common bulbul observations in Tanzania. If I zoom in, I can actually see individual points where people have observed this bird, including red dots mean recently. So I know that if I really wanted to see this bird, I could go to the places where there are red dots and find it. Uh, another way, if you don't want to look for particular birds, you just want to go where there are going to be lots of birds is to go back to the explore page and click explore hotspots. Hotspots are uh, popular or good birding locations that have been submitted or suggested by uh, other birders. So if we click on explore hotspots, we first start with a global map of all of the hotspots in the world. And you can see that the redder the color, the more bird species have been reported there. So if we really want to see a lot of birds, maybe Central America and South America are the best places to go. But uh, Eastern Africa also provides a lot of birding opportunities. So we can still again go to Tanzania and we'll zoom in and see all of the birding hotspots there. And so it looks like the Serengeti is definitely a place we want to go to find lots of birds. In fact, Serengeti National Park has observed over 577 different bird species people have reported there. And I can see the details to, there we go, uh, to see all of uh, recent reports. So on the 9th of March, someone reported these birds from Serengeti National Park. So I can actually say, if I'm going to Serengeti, what birds will I find there? Well, these are the birds that other people have reported recently. Uh, and so maybe I can expect to see those as well. One of my favorite features about the Explore Hotspots page is the illustrated checklist. And you can do this for any region for an entire country or a single site. But what it does is it gives you not only a bar chart of when a bird has been observed, but also photos and sounds that other people have taken of it. So not only can I see a list of birds that have been observed in the Serengeti, but I can actually see pictures of them as well, the best photos. And hey, if I see something that doesn't have a photo, maybe I'll take a picture of it and contribute it. And then my photo will show up on this page as well. So this is a fun way to, to just explore the birds that you could see on your travels and, and get excited for these trips. Uh, another fun feature that eBird offers that you can contribute to are photo streams of just great bird photos that are coming in on the web and that's through the search photos and sounds. So maybe you're not going to be traveling anytime soon, but you want to get that sense that you're on an exotic vacation or you want to get, you want to start planning your next trip. You can go to our live photo stream and type in a country and get either recently uploaded photos or my favorite is to go to best quality. And I just love browsing through these photos every day and just looking at these amazing photos of birds taken by people, uh, just other bird enthusiasts. It's a fun way to explore birds through eBird. So, 
again, all of this happens on eBird. And what this, everything you just saw is public contributions, people like you and me. And I will emphasize this over and over again, because what this means is that your birding checklists matter. When you submit observations to eBird, they power this amazing bird finding tool that also supports science and conservation. And I wanna focus now a little bit on that science and conservation part. What do scientists and conservations do with eBird data? Cause sure, exploring bird data is fun, but we can also put this to good use to support and conserve birds. And so one amazing thing that we can do with eBird data is we can plot all of these observations and model them. And we can do this. So this, what you're seeing here is a map of barn swallow observations modeled across all of North and South America. And we can follow the barn swallow across its annual migration from South America to its, uh, from its wintering grounds in South America, to restart the video, up through Central America to North America, where it is right now, where it'll breed, and then it'll return back down to South America. And this is only possible, these are cutting edge, highly detailed maps of distribution and abundance that are only possible with citizen science data. No field person could go out and collect all of this data. The cost and the time would be insurmountable. But through citizen scientist observations, we can begin to understand the life cycle of birds throughout the entire year. And we can also look at trends over time to understand where birds are doing well and maybe where they need a little bit of conservation help. For example, blue jays are declining on the East Coast. And we only know that because we've been able to track eBird observations over time. Um, and so now we can understand where to put forth conservation efforts to protect blue jays or uh, rarer species throughout the world. And so I'm happy to discuss a little bit more how your observations are used for science and conservation and also how you can contribute Again, we encourage you to go to that eBird Essentials course as your first step. We can discuss some more things later, but I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah, who's gonna talk about another way that, another great tool that your eBird observations can contribute to. So, Sarah. Thanks, Jenna. Um, great job. Let me set up my presentation right here. Presentation. Cool. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Merlin Bird ID app. Uh, as you submit your sightings to eBird, you're probably going to bump into a species that you've never seen before. Something that you have no idea what it is. Maybe it's, and this won't let me advance my slides. Ah, <laughs> maybe it is a new visitor to your backyard, or maybe on your travels, you see some stunning, almost unreal bird. The first step in finding out more about a bird and sharing your sighting with others is putting a name on it but that can be a challenge. You can try looking through a field guide. Um, it's often to an entire country. So you have to page through hundreds of pages of illustrations to find the one that matched what you saw. Or maybe you type in some of the details that you saw into trusty Google search and hope that it comes back with the bird that you saw. These can be really frustrating and time consuming. And here at the Cornell Lab, we get a lot of bird identification help requests. And we realized that people were looking for something something more. They wanted something that would help them identify birds. And here we have all these wonderful resources. We have millions of observations of birds from eBird that tell us when and where birds are occurring. We have millions of photos and sounds contributed from Macaulay Library users that show us what birds look and sound like. And so we decided to use these resources and build a tool to help people identify birds. So we created the Merlin Bird ID app. Merlin is essentially a birding coach. It'll walk you through the steps of a bird identification and suggest birds. And in doing so, it teaches you how to identify birds and what to look for. Ellen simply asks five questions. When and where did you see the bird? This is important for, uh, for narrowing down the options to those birds that are around you. What size was it? What was it colored? And what was it doing? Size and behavior are often overlooked, but they can be key details in a bird identification. The birds that you see on the ground at your feet are gonna be a lot different than the ones soaring high overhead. From those description, Merlin will return a short list of birds that match your description at your location. And this list is illustrated with professional quality photos and sounds, as well as ID tips written by experts, so you can be confident in finding the bird that matches what you saw. 
And Merlin doesn't just work off of a description, it can also run with photos. If you're in a place that's unfamiliar to you traveling and you can snap a photo with your phone or with a camera, Merlin can take that photo and run it through a state-of-the-art machine learning computer vision model, which will automatically identify the bird for you and bring up its list of suggestions. The photos and sounds and ID tips that Merlin presents to you, you can browse them in the Explore Birds screen. And this gives you a complete field guide to the birds of a region. But it goes even farther than that because we can connect this field guide with the eBird data on when and where birds are seen. And we can make a custom list of species in your area, in your immediate vicinity, that you can use to narrow down what to look for, what to study, maybe discover birds that you didn't know were in your area. This works anywhere in the world. And underneath each species name are those bar charts that Jenna mentioned. So you can learn when and where birds are occurring in your backyard or where you'll, wherever you'll be traveling. Plus, you can even sort this, and I find this really helpful when I'm traveling abroad. You can sort this by most likely, so that you start with the most relevant birds, the ones that you're most going to, going to want to know how to ID and most likely to encounter. I'll often just start at the top and start working my way down, and I know that I'm making the most efficient use of my time when I'm learning birds or when I'm looking for a bird that I, couldn't, that I just saw and I couldn't quite identify. You can also filter this by your eBird life list. So you can use it to look for birds around you that are new to your, uh, that you've never seen before. And I keep saying anywhere in the world, Merlin has, covers over 6,000 species, 60% of the birds of the world, and photo ID can work on more than 8,000 species. And we have almost complete coverage of all the species found in North and South America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, and most of Asia and we're actively working on figuring out the gaps. So wherever you're traveling, whether it's to Peru or Ecuador or Australia or Spain, Merlin has a complete coverage of those birds so that you can um, confidently know, uh, so you can confidently identify any unusual bird that you see. Plus, Merlin is available in seven different languages, so you can identify birds in whatever language you're most comfortable with. Merlin is a tool for you to use to discover the birds around you and start learning a little bit more about them so you can discover the wonderful things about the natural world, whether you're in your backyard or whether you're traveling abroad. Merlin's available on iOS and Android and you can download it on those app stores and we'll also be sending out a link to our website where you can find the, the quick links to the stores as well. Thank you all for your time. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Jen, I think at this point we'll turn it over to you if you'd like to talk a little bit about how we use eBird. Let me, uh, you may need to unmute yourself there, Jen. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm uh, just uh, sharing my screen now. Um, and hope everyone can see that. Um, We've got, um, we, we have um, travelers who go all over the world with our um, programs. Um, and I find that many of our travelers are already using eBird and to a lesser degree Merlin to keep track of what they're seeing on their trip. And it's a great way to keep track of things. Uh, we also do, usually on our trips, we have a bird checklist meeting at the end of each day where we can go through all of the sightings that, um, that we had in the day. Um, it's a very exciting way to, to go over that and, you know, with a nice drink and, uh, and your burning friends to talk about what it was, what you saw. Um, on, our, on our trips, we also, that, that list that we use at the end of each day is informed by eBird. So even if you're not using eBird and the app while you're in the field on our trips, it's there. <laughs> um, here is a look at um, some of the places that we go on our um, Ecuador birding trip that we do. Um, and each of these spots that we go to has a eBird hotspot that is um, associated with it. 
And so the checklist that we use, we have pulled the data from these hotspots and um, the checklists are of the birds that are most likely to see in those places. Because um, it's probably not likely that you're going to see a pelagic bird um, in Quito. <laughs> um, so we don't need to put that on the list and, and have that confuse people. Um, so our lists um, have just that information, um, making it a lot easier for you to keep track of what you've seen. Great, thank you, Jen. Uh, at this point, we'll go ahead and uh, open it up for Q&A. Uh, so, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, we do have a Q&A button available for people to submit their questions, and it looks like we already have received a few questions. Um, but um, we can go ahead and start accepting some of those questions. So if you have anything you'd like to ask our panelists, please go ahead and use that tool to type those in. And um, Jen, would you like to go ahead and uh, take it from here? Yeah, well, we've got a question from Becky Sheets. She would like to know, how does eBird interface with Merlin Bird ID app that I already have on my iPhone? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so there's a couple, a couple ways that the, uh, the two apps work together. Um, as you already saw from the presentation, um, Merlin uh, is powered by all this eBird data. Um, but one really useful thing is when you're out there using uh, the eBird app to record your sightings, if you tap on a bird's name, it pops up a, a little page that you can type in, you know, how many you saw and comments about it. But on that page, there's also a button that you can tap that will take you directly to that species in Merlin. Um, and so you can, you know, from the eBird app, launch Merlin to a species and you have a reference there for the sounds um, that the bird makes, um, for what it looks like. Um, and some ID text. So it's a, a really handy way to kind of remind yourself of what you're, um, what you're identifying. Um, if you, yeah, if you forget what it sounds like or, or something like that. Um, the other way it works, the two apps work together is you can log in with your account, your eBird account uh, through the Merlin app. Uh, and this will let you see your life list right in, in the app. Um, and one exciting thing that we're working on, um, hopefully for this summer, uh, is the ability to actually, um, when you make an identification in Merlin, um, to add that directly to your eBird life list. Um, so if you're, you know, out there and, uh, you know, exploring somewhere in Ecuador and you identify some crazy cool looking tanager um, with Merlin, um, you know, it'd just be one tap away to add that to your, your life list. All right, we have a question from Richard Rice, uh, who wants to know, since many of the observations are submitted by novice birders, how do you edit or verify the data accuracy? Also, since increasing numbers of people are submitting to eBird, how do you account for changes in bird populations when every year you are getting more submissions? Great questions, Richard. I'll take those. So to address your second question, how do we account for the fact that we're getting more submissions every year when we're estimating bird populations? Well, that's why we collect things like your effort, the number of people in your party, how far you traveled. These things are what we call birding effort. And we use them to, uh, to basically account for the amount of effort that people are putting towards birding every year. And when we take out all of that um, when we account for the fact that there is more effort every year, our statisticians can use those numbers to say, all right, well, accounting for the fact that we have more people birding every year, what are bird populations actually doing underneath all of that? So if you think about, uh, if, if you think about it as a filter, you have a lot of data coming in, you take out the noise of more and more submissions, there's still an underlying trend in bird populations. And so that's what we're trying to get at by the filter that we're building is the effort filter by accounting for things like distance and time and observer, if that makes sense. Um, it's, <laughs> the short answer is st statistics and analyses. Statistics and analyses is how we account for that. And that's why we collect lots of different numbers, not just the birds that you're seeing. 
you had another question about data quality. I actually saw several questions on the Q&A about data quality. And eBird does have a data review process to ensure that the numbers that we're providing to scientists are reliable and accurate. And also so that when you're using the site, you're seeing reliable and accurate numbers. And so this is a twofold system. The first is automatic filters that when you are submitting data will flag things that are unusual for your date and location. So that when you are in the field or when you are submitting numbers, you are getting a notification that, hey, something you've seen is, is unusual for this in date and time. Are you sure? Could you please take some extra photos or, or make some notes in the field so that you can document this observation more carefully? Then all of those flagged observations go to volunteer reviewers, over 1,800 volunteers around the world who manually look over all of these unusual reports and assess them to see whether or not they're documented, whether more information is needed, perhaps an ID mistake was made, uh, and correct those things so that the, the observations that are going into the database are confirmed and validated or um, that we're following up with you to, to get more information about your unique and really exciting observation. Every time you see a flag in the app, that's a, that's a sign that you've seen something really exciting. Um, so that's, a, that's our data review process. It's, it's a twofold system of automatic filters and then manual uh, volunteer review. Uh, and if you don't mind, there's another series of questions that I'm seeing in here that I'd like to answer, and that's about historical checklists. Whether or not you have a, a birding checklist from the previous day or the previous year, can you enter that into eBird? That answer is yes. You are welcome to enter the oldest checklists you have. Uh, this is called the historical birding protocol. And when you're learning about eBird, you're going to learn about the historical birding protocol. It is a way for you to enter your life lists or things that you have from the past that may not have all of the data that would require for a modern day eBird checklist, but still allow you to enter your observations in a way that can be used for science and conservation and ways that you can keep your life list, your historical life list up to date in eBird. We have an entire help page dedicated to uploading your life list to eBird. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, I would encourage you to check out our support page for more information. Wonderful. Um... Are you able to, can, can someone access Merlin or eBird data um, when you don't have internet access? So can you submit your lists even if you're not hooked up to the internet? Um, I can take the, uh, the Merlin side of that. Um, Merlin is, uh, we built it to work really well offline. Um, you obviously have to download the app and download the content while you still have a connection. Um, but if you, you know, look up any location, um, in the app through the explore tools or through the bird ID tools. Um, those, the birds at those locations are saved on your phone. Um, so if you're offline, you can still view that list of birds. You can um, explore all the photos, all the sounds, uh, the maps, the ID text, um, all offline. Um, so all of that works really great. The photo ID tool works completely offline. Um, so even if, when you're in the middle of the jungle and the Amazon, you can still, uh, identify the birds from the photos you're taking. Um, so yeah, all of that works really great offline. Um, it should work really well for you. Jenna, do you want to talk about the, the eBird app? Yeah. Offline? So the only thing to, the important thing to know about eBirding offline is that you'll just want to take a little bit of preparation in advance to download the pack for the area that you're going to be birding. So if you know where you're going and you know you're going to be offline for a little bit, just download the regional checklist in advance so you have it on your phone. And then you can be in airplane mode. You can have no cell service whatsoever. As long as you've got that pack, you're ready to keep lists. And then you won't be able to submit those lists until you're back into Wi-Fi, but you can store them on your phone as not submitted checklists. And when you have reception again, they're all saved and ready for you to just submit them. So it's entirely possible to, to eBird offline during your travels and then just save your checklist till you're back. Excellent. There were a couple questions relating to um, how, how eBird data might be shared with other online databases uh, like Esri ArcGIS Arc or um, with BirdNet. Um, is, does eBird talk to these other sources? Is the data being shared at some level? So eBird shares our observations with the GBIF Global Biodiversity Information um, system. So that's another way to, to access these GIS coordinates. We also offer our full database available for free for research and, uh, and 
um, studies and that sort of thing. So if you just have a personal thing, you want to download all of your bird observations for and GPS locations for your own mapping purposes, that's available to you as well. Um, if you're working on a research project and need detailed lat longs for a certain area or a certain species, that's available to you. Just request it through our website. Uh, unfortunately, we do not share our database with other birding apps like BirdNet. However, if you have BirdNet data you would like to transfer to eBird, we do offer ways of doing that through spreadsheets. So if you've got spreadsheet data of any format, there's a way to uh, format it for eBird instead. And we've got a, a help page. There's a help page for that as well. <laughs> I can I can comment on the the sounds um, the sound ID stuff and BirdNet. Um, so I, I think some of you it sounds like have uh, already discovered the BirdNet app. Um, that's a kind of a, a prototype beta project that um, our bioacoustics team is working on, um, and it's you know machine learning to identify bird sounds, and it's really exciting. They've they've done a whole lot to make it really really uh, accurate. Um, Currently, it's a, it's a beta app that's just available for Android. Um, but you can also go to BirdNet, um, I believe it's birdnet.cornell.edu, um, and upload your bird recordings um, via your browser. Um, and it does a really good job of identifying the things that you've recorded with your, with your phone. Um, it's something that we're, we're definitely looking into um, for adding to Merlin. Um, it seems like a, you know obvious additional thing to go along with photo identification. Um, so look for that in the next next year or so um, as we as we um, collect more audio recordings and are able to train the, the machine learning models to identify birds. There were several questions related to photographs. Um, in particular, people who have photographs from past trips that um, they might want to add into eBird. Um, you can put in a, a checklist from the past. Can you also do that with photos? Yes, we, we would love it. In fact, the, the growth that we're seeing in photo and audio recordings right now, that massive increase in uploads of these types of media is a, what we think is a direct result of people having a little more time on their hands right now to go through those historic trips and finally get all of their thousands of photos into eBird that they've been meaning to forever. Um, so that answer is yes, you can uh, upload checklists. They're, um, depending on the information you have, whether or not you have a general location, or if you have checklists for every single trip, no matter how you get it into eBird, once it's in eBird, you can upload your photos to those checklists. And we do have a 10 photo limit per species per checklist. So um, you'll have to pick your 10 best photos of that species at that date to, uh, to share it with us. But yes, you're, you're totally welcome to upload your historical photos and archive them through our system. Um, Phyllis had a question, uh, and one thing that's really important to note is that right now, in order to use some of our Explore tools, you're going to need a free Cornell Lab account. It's free to set up. Um, it will help, it, it'll be applicable to Merlin and eBird. The same account works on both systems. The reason you need an account is this exciting growth that we've been seeing recently has caused us to uh, pass the threshold of what the Google mapping platform allows for our system. So we have so many people using the system right now that they can no longer support our maps on Google Maps. And so we're restricting usage to people who have accounts just so that we can stay within the limits that Google allows us to use for their mapping servers. All right. Um, here's a question about um, unusual sightings. Um, if, if, if there's an email alert function that sends information on unusual sightings to an area, how is unusual determined? Uh, unusual is determined by those automated filters. So like I mentioned earlier, there are certain uh, filters. They're set by regional experts that determine what's unusual for a date and time. And if you submit something, a species in particular, if you submit a species that is rare for your date and location, that's what ends up going into the rare bird alerts. So the way to know that when you're submitting an observation is that we'll have an R icon. R stands for rare. Any bird that shows up with that on a checklist will be sent to the rare bird alerts. We have a second rare bird alert that's uh, designated for American Birding Association rarities. These are nationwide level rarities, things that are unusual for the entirety of Canada and the United States. And so that's a, an ultra, ultra rare list that's separate from things that might be unusual for your location. So those are the two types of alerts that we offer. That's also on the Explore page. Uh, there are, um, you can sign up for 
notifications of when unusual birds have been reported near you and you'll get an email either hourly or per day when something exciting shows up. All right, we have a question from Susan Gare. How do you get a Cornell account? Uh, if you just head over to ebird.org and there'll be a blue button in the upper right hand corner that says create an account. I feel like it may be green now, um, but that's the best place to go. Just ebird.org and then up, look in the upper right hand corner. Powering through some more of these questions. Um, we have Alice Smith who recently traveled to Tanzania and um, looks like a year later they realized that the bird ID'd by their expert on, on their list might not have been correct. Um, can you make corrections to your list? Yes, yes, you definitely can. You can, you can always go back and, uh, and make changes. And we've just updated our system now that if you go back and make changes to an old list, it will refresh itself back into the review process and get, uh, get a new chance to be um, assessed by our reviewers and validated. So, and there's a, an important thing, eBird has a really nice sharing system where you can keep one checklist for your entire group, just have one checklist for everyone, share it with the individuals in your group, and then they can edit their own personal copy of that checklist to reflect the species that they saw, so that you don't have to worry if, if maybe a couple people in your group missed an ultra cool bird that you got a photo of, that you don't, you can have that on your list without worrying about them um, needing a separate checklist because they didn't see all the species you did. But what that does mean is that if you make changes to your list, you will need to reshare it with everyone so their version of the checklist is updated. So that's just something to keep in mind is if everyone needs to update their list, just reshare it. Okay. Um... How do you get to eBird hotspots from Merlin on the mobile app? Do they talk to each other? Uh, I mean, they do talk to each other, but uh, that sort of display isn't currently available. However, um, it is coming soon to the eBird app. Um, you'll be able to look up locations that uh, other people have flagged as being um, really great for birding. Um, so you'll be able to explore other hotspots right through the, the eBird app itself. Okay. And um, if you are adding photos to an eBird list, um, can you, you can do that from the app and, um, or, or do you have to do that from a desktop only? You don't need to do it on a desktop, but unfortunately cannot do it within the eBird mobile app. But what you should do is once you've submitted a checklist through the app, go to that checklist and you'll see a link on the bottom that says uh, eBird.org tap that link and it will open the checklist, the website version of the checklist on your mobile device. So then you can add photos and sounds through your mobile device just using a browser rather than the app. So that's a way to link your app to, the, to a web browser so you can upload photos is just go to ebird.org through the app. Here's this question from Stephen Mink. Do you track how schools, say science classes, are using eBird and Merlin and how this might be facilitated for schools in parts of Africa where the data coverage is thin? Uh, we do track how people are using our data. Every time you download the full database or a regional database that includes more than just your observations, we do ask that you send us a little information so we understand how you're using the, um, the data, what your intended out outcomes or pro products are. Um, and so we do have ways of tracking who's using it. I will say anecdotally, we have seen a large uptick in data requests from schools and at-home educators developing research curriculums for students to use on their computers when they're not in the classroom through eBird data. Everything from elementary students just exploring bird observations to grad students looking for new ways and new projects to use bird data. They're all requesting eBird data right now. Um, and then in terms of outreach, getting more data from these underrepresented areas, uh, we are, we're always looking for new opportunities and new inroads. And we do provide things called portals, which allow local communities to develop an eBird page and an eBird resource specific to their communities. And so I think we, we have at least one eBird portal in Africa and we're always looking to, to grow more. So that's a great opportunity for these communities. They're welcome to reach out to us um, and we'll help them develop these resources. Yeah, our first eBird portal is in uh, Rwanda, right? I think that's, that's right. Pretty cool. Yeah, we're, we're always looking for uh, more partnerships in, uh, in, yeah, in Africa. Um, and we just recently released, you know, PAC that includes all of the species of South Africa 
um, and are looking to re, uh, work with uh, local organizations there um, to really get a foothold in, in Africa. I mean, we, we've done a lot of outreach in the Americas um, through you know, pro providing portals and bird packs for Merlin um, and doing presentations. And so we're, we're kind of looking to do that same thing in, in Africa um, in the upcoming years. Um, and I see that there are a couple, I think Alice, Alice said we should ask for financial support. We do offer this as an entirely free uh, resource for everyone to use. If you'd like to make a contribution, if you appreciate, appreciate Merlin, if you appreciate eBird and would like to contribute, consider becoming a Cornell Lab member. It will support all of our programs and more, including uh, academy courses, uh, K through 12 learning curriculums, that sort of thing. All becoming a uh, Cornell Lab member will support all of these projects. Um, and then if you also make a, a contribution, become an eBird beta tester, which means that you can get developments and new versions of the app before anyone else and you can test them out. So if you're a diehard eBird user who wants to know what we're working on next, that's a great way to become, uh, to become more involved is by being a beta tester. Um, it, that almost wraps up all the questions that we have um, within the, um, the, the, the webinar. I do have a couple of questions that were asked prior to the webinar. Um, so I wanted to get, gather, just get some information for those. Um, so one of the questions we received was, can eBird be used to know in almost real time what bird species are currently in migration? Sarah, do you want to take this one? Ah, sure thing. Um, yes, yeah, so there's, you've seen the, in these, um, in these presentations, you've seen there are a lot of different ways to kind of explore eBird data and explore um, data through Merlin. But the most um, direct way that I think you can use to answer this question is um, through another project that the lab offers called BirdCast. And if I can share my screen. Jen, yep. Yeah. Um, let me pop open. Uh, the website is birdcast.info, and this is um, state-of-the-art modeling of bird migration using uh, radar in order to um, measure how birds are moving across the country. And so they have these really cool migration forecasts that show which areas of the country are having uh, birds are moving the most, and they also have um, really useful species on the move pages. And these use eBird data to tell you what birds people have been reporting and which birds are just beginning to come into, into your region, um, when, there'll be, when they're peaking, when they're gonna be uh, trickling out, um, and you can explore what migrants are coming uh, through the BirdCast website. Excellent. Ronald Dobbin wants to know, how are rare bird sightings vetted? Hey Ron, this goes into our uh, review system that I mentioned earlier, the, the 1800 volunteer reviewers all around the world who are going through and manually looking at rare or unusual bird observations to um, assess what we call documentation. So documentation is a combination of photos, sound recordings, or field notes that you've taken about a bird. This is why we've got that little R icon when you're submitting a checklist is in a way of identifying that you've got something that needs just a little closer look, something that's unusual that could use a photo if you've got the opportunity or just some really detailed field notes of what you've seen. And then someone's going to look at the documentation you've provided and assess whether it confirms the species that you said it was or whether maybe there's some opportunity that you just need to clarify the notes. Maybe there's uh, some confusion as to what the bird was. Um, that sort of thing. Even our, our best experts and leaders of the project still make mistakes sometimes. And so that's why photos, sound recordings, and notes are so important to support and provide evidence for unusual observations. So ob observations and reports are vetted through the documentation that you provide. And the more documentation you provide, the easier it is and the quicker it is to vet these and just say, accept. Ron knows what he's talking about. Look at this amazing photo he took. It's clearly what he said it is approved. All right. Um, do we have time for a few more questions, Lindsay? Um, I would say maybe one or two more if we have a, a quick couple quick questions and then we can uh, wrap it up. Okay. Uh, I know that um, Jenna, you had said that, that you 
wanted to um, talk a little bit about historical data. I think you talked a little bit about that. Did you, you answered that fully and completely, correct? Uh, I, will, I will add that if you've got spreadsheets, it's okay. We do have a data import system that will allow you to bulk upload up to two megabytes per spreadsheet, which is a, a lot of data. So it does, if you have a ton of checklists that you would like to add to our system, they're currently on a spreadsheet, there are ways of getting it into eBird. Okay, great. And where can we go for more information and for self-training programs if we want to be eBird experts? The Essentials course is definitely the best place to start. And then uh, if you're ready for some, uh, some more advanced tools, some, some cooler ways of using the system, our support page offers some tips and tricks, which will help you as an experienced user use it more effectively. Things like short codes. You don't have to enter the whole species name. You can just enter four letters and eBird Mobile will find that species for you. Um, or uh, ways of sorting your list so that the most likely species are at the top and the rare birds are down at the bottom so that you can see the birds that you are most likely to see right at the top. So you don't have to go scrolling through the whole page, those sorts of things. So eBird Essentials, then the support page, uh, and then just keep using the system. Let us know if you have questions um, and get more comfortable with it. And we're, we're just glad to have you no matter what level of eBirder you are. Great. Well, thank you. And I'll mention as well that we'll be sending out some of these resources that you've mentioned um, when we send our follow up communication so people can uh, check out these tools and, and hopefully get more familiar with, uh, with all of these options. Um, so I want to say thank you to our panelists today, our presenters. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, before I wrap up, I guess I have a question, which is, do you have anything else that you'd like to add or any final thoughts that you'd like to make sure that people are aware of either about eBird or about the work that you're doing or, or uh, conservation in general? Uh, I'll just add that Jenna mentioned the support pages for eBird are a great place to go for questions. Um, Merlin is on the same support page system. So if you have any questions about using Merlin, we have a tips and tricks page for um, similarly finding, finding neat tips and tricks to improve your, um, what you can do with Merlin. Uh, it's all on our support page. Great, thank you. And I'll just say thanks. Thanks to everyone. Every checklist matters. Every bird observation matters. They go to, to support some amazing conservation projects around the world, which unfortunately we didn't have a chance to get into today. But if you just head over to our science page on the eBird website, you'll see how these observations are being used on the ground. And you make a difference. So thank you so much to all of our existing eBird users and for the new ones, welcome aboard. Great. Well, thank you again uh, for uh, an excellent and interesting presentation. Uh, before we wrap up, I'll just make a quick announcement about our next webinar uh, that we have coming up. Uh, we'll be uh, bringing Costa Rica to you. We, this will be taking place a week from today, uh, Wednesday the 20th. This is the next webinar in our series. And we'll be hearing from some of our partners in Costa Rica who are excited to share their beautiful country with you and talking about some of the things that are going on there currently and what we might be able to expect in the future. Um, so we hope you can join us. And with that, we conclude our webinar today. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists again for joining us and sharing their expertise. And thank you to everyone who attended. And we hope you found the presentation interesting and informative. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar today along with those links and resources that were mentioned. Uh, so thank you again to everyone who joined us and have a great rest of your afternoon.